American Safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. There's been mayhem and madness. There's been bone crunching and hunting. We're surrounded by wildebeest. These lions have managed to succeed in taking down. We've got three vehicles with incredible animals spread through the Mara. This is... Hello, I hope you're well and filled with anticipation. It's marvellous to have you back here live in the Maasai Mara for the fifth astounding week of the wildebeest migration. My name is James Henry and this splendid collection of skulls and books and uber technology teetering on the edge of the Olololo escarpment is of course the migration control. The Mara floor where Brent and Jamie and Scott have been out all night long is bathed in a dim blue moonlight. The predator's banquet is laden with an entree of thousands of wildebeest, thousands of zebra and in a few weeks Thompson's gazelle pudding. Now the most important part of any immersive wilderness experience is you and that means we'd love to hear from you. You can tweet us using the hashtag Safari Live. You can send us your questions or comments and the first thing I'd like to know from you is how would you feel watching the golden sunrise over the Mara. Now, where in the wilderness are we? We are 5,000 feet above sea level in a volcanically active part of East Africa. It supports some 60 mammal species, 470 bird species, and used to look after a number of our own human ancestors. That's not one of them, that's a monkey. You've just met Brent and his lions. They're thankfully sly. That looks a bit like Brent rather than a lion. They had a rather busy night. Now, despite the fact that they are surrounded by more than half a million wildebeest in the Mara right now, this pride decided they wanted a more exotic meal. Artfark. There are a few fascinating things about this. Firstly, the speed of the aardvark. It certainly doesn't look like it could move this quickly. And secondly, how long the lions were prepared to chase it, despite the bounty of the migration all around. Just look at the wildebeest eyes flashing there. Then there was the digging. Somehow the aardvark managed to find a burrow in the darkness and once safely underground, the lions had no chance. Let's go to Brent. Welcome back live on the vehicle and there are the lions that went on an art fark hunt and uh, well my dawn this morning smells a bit like a butchery because we're downwind of a fresh wildebeest kill this happened not very long ago but over the night these lions hunted about nine times including that incredible art fark hunt now an art fark is not something you see very often and art fark actually translates to earth pig and uh, they are termite eaters and they're incredible burrowers and that's how it managed to escape with that incredible speed which i never expected an art fark to have away from those lions now these lions are sitting in the pitch black at the moment so we're using lots of special tools out here and we've got infrared lights now there we go now is that incredible even with all this food around there's still that instinctive competition for meat and uh, the male being or taking the lion's share so to speak and, and giving the lioness a little bit of a swat around the ears nothing too serious and uh, very common lion behavior now there are another two lionesses lying down in the grass around us here now because they've got this young male with them there's a very good chance they might hunt again and uh, for those of you who are wondering yes this is a hundred percent live from Kenya and uh, Masai Mara, where are you off to, madam? Are you going to go look for your sisters? And Larry has gone ahead of everyone using that hashtag Safari Live to ask us questions. Larry wants to know uh, where the lions will look for weak members of the herds to target. Most definitely, uh, Larry, it is if there's a slight limp or weakness that the lions can pick up, they will take advantage of that and it is an amazing thing because sometimes it's something we cannot see and uh, I always find it fascinating to watch the dynamics of a hunt, the, the, the visual cues between the different individual lionesses. Are you feeling lonely now? Now, of course, I'm not the only one out here, and Jamie had incredible action throughout the night, but James is going to take you through it. I can hear zebra stampeding, so maybe those lions are on the hunt again. 
Yes, indeed, an astounding night of action. Before we get on to that, quickly to tell you, Scott is over here south of the Talek River, hopefully with his cheetah shortly. You've just met Brent. He's around this region here. And Jamie, who had a really astounding night, is over here. Jamie has all the technology on her car. She's got a FLIR thermal camera and infrared so as not to disturb the animal behavior. Just take a look at what she saw. For Jamie, the night started as a pretty standard migration way. Lions approaching a herd of wildebeest, nothing unusual there. Youngster becomes separated from the safety of the herd, and then a young male nabs it. The plucky thing puts up a good fight, but eventually succumbs. But then there's just chaos and carnage. The lions operating on the instinct to chase and kill rather than on hunger. Among inst the thundering hooves and dust, they take every opportunity to kill, seemingly reckless with their own safety. As the terrified gnus swirl in confusion, they don't eat any, but they simply move on to the next kill. And what begins as an interesting display of lions interacting with the migration quite quickly becomes a disturbing exposition of nature at her harshest. There's no cruelty here, but it's macabre and difficult to explain. Over to Jamie. What a truly extraordinary evening last night was, and if it's anything to go by, I think that we have an extraordinary morning ahead of us as well. Just look at the wildebeest. You're looking at the heat signatures of thousands and thousands of wildebeest scattered throughout the plains of the Mara Triangle, and we were right in the middle of them last night. Oh, very good morning to all of you. My name is Jamie. This morning, Viam is on camera with me and as I said we've had the most extraordinary evening some of it was very difficult some of it if I'm completely honest was actually a little bit scary just the whole process of watching first of all the way in which the poor wildebeest were completely panicked as they raced away from those male lions but at one point while we were watching the lions catch the next wildebeest and the next wildebeest the situation became a little bit hairy for us as well and when you You've got a good, I would say, at least 10,000 wildebeest panicking around you. Perhaps I'm exaggerating, but in the dark, that's certainly what it felt like. They were racing in circles around us, and unfortunately, it was time for us to leave. It was getting dangerous for both us and for the wildebeest. They were too panicked to realize that, they were, that we were there, and we had to keep moving out of their way. Now, the question is, where have our young male lions gone? I've arrived very close to where we left them. There's lots of relatively calm wildebeest, and you're actually, oh, there they go, racing off again. So I said relatively calm, but in the dark they are particularly panicky. And off they go. Why have they run away? You can see, look at all of the eyes, look at all of them reflecting. We are using the most incredible camera that makes use of every little ounce of available ambient light to bring you this image in color. And we've been out here all night having the entire Maasai Mara all to ourselves. Now we've just got to figure out where those young males went. They're somewhere here. We know it, and the wildebeest know it as well. And you can't blame them for being terrified. Pitch black, unable to see a thing, lions racing into the middle of them. It was actually quite astounding. And you can see one wildebeest not looking terribly good. Oh, of course, Brent, Scott and myself are spread out across the Maasai Mara. Scott is on the opposite side of the river and he's been spending the evening, hopefully slightly more peacefully, with a different type of predator. That cheetah is going to have, at least not cheetah, wildebeest is going to have an uncomfortable morning. Now, last week I called Scott the cheetah man of Africa and he has lived up to that name during the course of the night. Have a look at what he saw just as the sun went down yesterday. Here are some ostriches. Cheetah have hunted ostriches before, but if you look at them, I think it must be quite difficult to decide which bit to bite. Thompson's gazelle are a good option, but they're extremely fast, especially on the plains and in good light. Wildebeest are often too tough for one, but for five, they're perfect. Look at the musketeers suddenly finding focus here. The gnus are slow and easily panicked. The clever cats have worked this out, and what you're seeing here happens just about every migration evening. From the panicked herds, they single out a young and home in together. Let's go and find out from Scott what they achieved for the rest of the evening. 
Right, Scott has lost his signal there, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. He is in a difficult region. That's over here. That's on the Talek River. And there's a real depression there, and so that's why he's managed to lose a uh, signal there. All right, Brent's lines are on the move, so let's go and find out if they're going to hunt. Well, we're with that lioness that just got chased off the carcass by the male. And... Uh, 360 degrees around us are wildebeest but at the moment I think she's looking for the other ladies that are missing from her pride so here we go in the pitch black off-road isn't this exciting hopefully I don't fall into a big hole but um, I'm oh, gonna put a little bit of light on in front now remember this is live we cannot predict what's happening uh, I'm gonna ask Dave to switch on the infrared lights again so we can just keep an eye on where she is so I don't have to use the spotlight there we go and that the reason we do that we'll use the spotlight to a certain where an animal is and whatnot but if we can we try not use any light at all we don't want to affect an advantage either the predator or the prey we want to see nature at its most pure and this is one thing that I really love we, there's no lying there's no shortcuts what you see is happening right now Now, a good evening, well, a good morning for me, a good evening to you, Rihanna. Uh, Rihanna would like to know how long can lions go without eating? They can go a lot longer than you would think. Uh, I would say probably over 10 days, probably pushing up to two weeks. But they normally eat probably every three or four days. But of course, at the moment, it is a time of plenty because we are surrounded by thousands upon thousands of wildebeest and zebra. At this time of the year, these lions will gorge themselves. Now I'm just going to keep quiet for a second and let you listen. Now those wildebeest are not far at all. Boom. I always would love to wonder what are they thinking? Now Reed has got a very good question. Are wildebeest faster than lions? Uh, Reed, over a long distance, yes, but over a short distance, lions have an incredible acceleration. But they generally like to be within about 30 or 40 feet uh, for them to use that, that, that incredible acceleration. Anything longer than that, uh, they send, tend to lose uh, momentum. So they are definitely sprinters, whereas the wildebeest can keep up a much higher speed over a longer distance. But what happens now, because the herds are so big, uh, the lions will often almost just jog into them and create absolute confusion. And uh, and especially with the young ones, the young ones get separated, the wildebeest run into each other. And uh, as you saw in Jamie's clip, so it, it can be very confusing and lions instinctively kill. They are not mean, they are not evil, they cannot help themselves. As soon as something runs at them, even if they've got a full belly, even if they've got a kill right next to them, they have to leap. It is bred into them. As I said, I think she's looking for the rest of the members of her pride. She's listening carefully. I was just trying to listen to see if there were any contact calls from the rest of the females. And you can see she's not full yet, so I'm very hopeful she's going to go on the hunt. But while we wait for her to do that, let's go back to the man on top of the hill, the king in his castle, James in migration control. Indeed, we are perched 1,000 feet above Brent there and his lions, and that means that we have the best view in the world. But quite apart from providing me a very pleasant place to eke out my meagre existence, the migration control has a much more important function. It has to draw together all the complex elements of the migration story into a cogent narrative, and this is how we achieve it. Perched on the Ulu Lolo escarpment with a heart-stopping view of the Maasai Mara is the migration control. From this vantage point, some 1,000 feet above the Mara, the migration control has an unparalleled view of the drama unfolding below. It is in this space where the narrative of the complex and wondrous wildebeest migration below is told. From maps and figurines, as well as a sophisticated network of river and mountain cameras, 
Every day, the cameras reveal new secrets as thousands of topi, zebra, and wildebeest attempt the perilous, crocodile-infested waters of the Mara River. The migration control combines vast herds and unending dramas into a single epic story. We have got a very special surprise for you. You are back live. You've got an idea of where the wildebeest herds are. And of course, now we have found our lions that have taken full advantage. Listen. He's roaring. Okay, we're going to get a little bit closer. We're going to catch up with them because we finally found them. Phew. I can't tell you how disorienting it is in the dark. He's still quite far away from me. We're going to get a little bit closer. And he's uh, proclaiming his triumph after a night that has proved to be exceptionally successful for them. And I can just see him off in the gloom. There we go. Our moonlight camera taking full advantage of the ambient light that is provided by the pre-dawn. And that is one of the male lions responsible for the chaos last night. And that brings us to our question from Terry. Terry, you would like to know how often the male lions hunt. As we saw last night, much like perhaps your house cat at home, their hunting instinct is separate from their essentially their hunger and although they could hunt pretty much every single day last night these lions killed at least seven wildebeest and they're on the move once again towards more we're going to catch up with them it sounds as though brent is having an equally active morning well there we go we've got some nervous wildebeest they have spotted the lions but all four lions are on the hunt again the male has abandoned that carcass without finishing it look at that look at her ears perked up staring into the darkness thinking about her next meal isn't this so exciting remember live from kenya we are with lions in the pre-dawn darkness and it looks like they're gonna hunt again We've been with this pride since about five o'clock yesterday evening. And they've had nine unsuccessful hunts. One successful. Now, Luke is wondering, is there anything the wildebeest can do to stop the lions? Uh, Luke spot them early is a pretty much the only thing they can do once the wildebeest have spotted the lions uh, the game is up and i think that has happened here now we can hear the very distinct new 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 which is the wildebeest talking to each other saying how are you i'm fine how's the red oat grass no it's okay i think it's going to be better in the south no i disagree in the north but when they change from that new new to it means lion Lion, watch out! Watch out! Danger! So, I'm just going to have a quick look. We've still got one lioness there. The others have moved down the road, but they're not particularly trying to hide. Now, they could try sneak around these wildebeest. There's another lioness right in front of us, Dave. Now, I'm starting to be able to see a little bit without, with my eyes um, as the dawn starts to slowly lighten up behind us. It's quite cloudy this morning. There's a bit of a breeze, which is perfect hunting weather for these lions. So, the longer it stays a little bit darker, the worse the wildebeest eyesight is and the better chance the lions have of making a kill. They can see eight times better in the dark than us and probably about four times better than the wildebeest. Okay, let's keep up with them. A very very interesting question and, and and it's something that's quite apparent up here and especially with the sheer number of animals we have and Shamsung is wondering do the lions ever get caught in a stampede while they're hunting now 
in my experience, it seems the wildebeest will stay away, but actually sometimes run very close. I don't think an adult lion is in danger, but remember, this is the wild, and if I say, they're never going to get stampeded next week, a lion will be stampeded by the wildebeest. So, I say it's highly unlikely, but it is not impossible. Ooh, 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 I can just make our lion is heading towards the herd. There's panic. There's actually other lions chasing them now. Uh, we don't know what's going on. There's just wildebeest streaming in every direction. There could easily be other lions or even hyenas chasing them from the other side. Now that is not our lions doing that. But our lions are running in. Something is going on. I'm not sure what it is. Okay. You see our lions in front of us? Yes, hold on everyone. We are going to have to go off the road. It could be holes, could be rocks. Not sure what's going on. We're trying to go. Oh, there we go. Hold on. As I say, what is going on? There was absolute pandemonium, just full to be streaming in every direction. Oh, and it's in the long grass. Not sure what's going on. But you're going to have to come back after this short break to find out, to see what's happening live in the Mara. Guys, and this is so exciting. Oh, what's this? I've got lions in front of me. Now, is this a different pride? Could there be other lions? Or is it another kill? It's another kill. The wildebeest is still alive. Now, this for sensitive viewers, guys, please be careful. Sometimes the lions do take their time to kill the wildebeest. Now, that little grunt, now, just to, it can be quite difficult. Now, the male's about to walk in. Now, as you can see, Quite often, lions will start feeding on an animal while it's still alive. Now, I still don't know how. We, uh, one of the lionesses must have just snuck off. Well, there could be another lioness here. And it's quite often that the prides will split. And, oh, that is a terrible sound. As I said, for sensitive viewers, it might be a good time to go get a cup of coffee. The one thing is that these animals are probably in in quite a lot of shock and are not feeling everything. I'm just going to move around to the other side. Oh, there's one of the holes I was talking about trying to avoid. There we go, Dave. So, strangely enough, the female who did the initial grabbing of the wildebeest has let go of the suffocation hold, and the young male has taken over. Now, they've abandoned more than half a car carcass. Oh, they're going to have a play instead. Oh, let me just... And the females are walking away again. Okay, I'm just trying to see what's going on. The lionesses look like they might actually just go on the hunt again. Now, this is not uncommon behavior during the migration. And you find sometimes a field littered with carcasses, barely touched. Okay. Okay. 
and you're just just watching what they're up to. Oh, the male's dragging the carcass off. Welcome back guys, as you left I was rushing through the long grass to see what had happened. One of our lionesses snuck off and killed another wildebeest and the lion being the lion came and took the lion's share and it looks like the females are moving off again so there's a possibility they're going to hunt again. This is incredible behavior and not uncommon during the migration. It is absolute pandemonium when one, one over a million, nearly two million animals arrive and these lions just feast and feast and feast. They've abandoned almost a half carcass and they've killed another one and the males come in and he's actually chased the females off and he's doing the suffocation work because that wildebeest is still alive. So if you are sensitive, please be warned um, that sometimes being live out here, we can't control what's going to happen and some things can be a little bit gruesome. Well, there goes the last sort of breath out of that wildebeest. Now, Turbo is wondering, why do lions bite down on the rear of their prey? Um, quite often, Turbo, when they're doing that, um, especially with large prey, is that they'll try to get into the spine, but on smaller prey like wildebeest, they'll go normally for the traditional suffocation hold, which this male is holding at the moment. Oh, we got a hyena, we got a hyena coming in here. This could be really interesting. Well spotted, Dave. There we go, we've got a single hyena. Now, there is a, a relatively big clan around here called South Clan. No, that hyena by himself versus a male lion decided discretion is the better part of valor. But, could call for some friends, then things could get interesting. Now the girls have moved off. And hasn't this been absolutely exhilarating so far this morning? We've had lions, we've had hyenas, we've already had our first kill. I'm going to follow the females because I think they're not done for this cold, windy, overcast morning yet. But we haven't got to meet Scott yet. And he has got possibly one of the most sleek and elegant animals in the whole world. Hello everyone, and I think Brent was referring to the cheetah, not the hippo in the background. That's just come into focus. It's great to have you on board. We are sitting here with not one, not two, not three, not four, but actually five male cheetah. So we've got a great, great lineup ahead of this morning safari. You've already got off to a great start with Brent. My name's Scott. I'm teamed up with jean -Dre on camera. And these cheats are busy trying to work out whether it's worth risking crossing this river. There's a few crocodile that live here. Of course, you, can, you saw the hippo that's busy wallowing upstream. And they will be cautious of both of these creatures, but definitely more so the crocodile. But gee, this is really interesting. They're getting really, really scared of this hippo. And it's, I'm not sure if we can see the hippo. I think the hippo's also a little bit nervous. It may, in this low light, think that they are lion. And even though it's a ginormous animal that's very difficult for lions to hunt, it will certainly 
pay them respect. I guess just like the hyena paid the lion its dues a little bit earlier on Brent's vehicle. Now, this coalition of male cheetah are called the Musketeers. Some of you who have been on safari with us before would have already met them. They're an incredibly formidable team. It's uncommon to have as many as five males joining forces. He has one coming right past the vehicle, Jean-André on the left. And we have certainly seen some wonderful, wonderful action from these guys. And who knows, this morning, if they come across wildebeest, which is certainly their favorite prey, they will, in all likelihood, succeed in bringing them down. We have not seen them fail in hunting. It is just a matter of time that they manage to bring something down. Last night was testament to that, and we will be able to show you some action that has been unfolding in the last few hours. Joshua, great to have you on board. You would like to know which is the biggest or what is the biggest coalition of male cheetah in the Masai Mara, and these are them. As far as I know, there's one or two other coalitions of two males, and then a lot of solitary males moving around but none close to as big as this coalition of five. So, like I said, we couldn't be in a better position. There are quite a few wildebeest in this area of the Mara, not as many as across where Brent and Jamie are, but there is certainly a lot of food here, and they could stumble across them at any point in time. It looks like they're not going to take the risk of crossing the river, so we are going to send you back to James to let you know a little bit about more about what the herds are doing at the moment. Just before I do that, everybody, thank you very much to DJ Stanford Tobias and uh, the name I have now failed to read. Never mind, uh, you all got hold of us using the hashtag Safari Live to tell us that DJ, you said the sunrise would make you feel ecstatic. Tobias, you said awestruck. And the name I can't read because I can't write. A uh, privileged, I think it was. Thank you very much for your answers. And anybody who else who would like to get hold of us, it was Sarah actually, uh, who, who would like to get hold of us, hashtag Safari Live is how you do that. Now, the herds, I told you last week were crossing over the Mara River here in in the Lamai Wedge. They did come up into the Masai Mara along the escarpment and they moved in this sort of direction here. There's been a lot of rain this week and I think that the storms have probably drawn the animals around to these areas but until you have actually seen the numbers that we saw this week from the air it's very difficult to conceptualize of what the migration can look like. Have a look. This stupefying scene of countless wildebeest left me slack-jawed. It was impossible to count the extent of what I think looks like liberal sprinklings of black pepper or swarming ants. Now, try to imagine the tons of grass eaten and the volume of fertilizer in the form of dung and urine produced while the herds are around. And because of that, obviously, this ecosystem completely dependent on its, each other. On, everything is dependent on itself. So we've got the grass dependent on the fertilizer of the wildebeest, the wildebeest of course dependent on the grass. Nothing would function without the other. Let's head back to the great eaters of the wildebeest with Jamie. The great eaters of wildebeest and in fact the poor terrified wildebeest themselves. Our lions not satisfied with their night's work moving with great purpose back towards another wildebeest herd once again. And it's been a truly extraordinary experience because essentially we've watched them kill and abandon their kills. Probably I would say a good, good eight times, nine times. And it seems to us from a human perspective to be such a waste and such a strange thing to do. But remember, these are young males. This is the first time they've ever been on their own during the time of the migration. And it is such a fantastic way for them to actually practice the skills that they're going to need over the coming years now that they have heard these young males for quite a few weeks now, whenever we can find them. And Emma, you would like to know how long the average lion hunt takes. Now let's try and get us a little bit closer. It very much depends, Emma, as to whether or not the lions have got plenty of cover. It depends whether it's day or night. I've watched lion hunts that have taken up to easily, I would say, an hour. A stalk, very slow, very careful. And last night, those lion hunt happened in the matter of minutes. And then wildebeest after wildebeest after wildebeest okay we're going to get a little bit closer making sure that we don't give away the lion's position let's go back to brent to see what his lions are up to 
Well, while we were focused on the mail, the girls were up to mischief behind us and they caught a young wildebeest that obviously was separated during the pandemonium earlier. And uh, we have, obviously you can see there's enough light now. We've switched from IR into color. And uh, that wildebeest that was just killed seconds ago, or minutes ago, now I'm exaggerating slightly, the male has abandoned. Now, I wonder if the hyenas are going to come in. Um, all our lions are getting up. The lionesses are heading towards the male now. And there are herds still around us. Now, earlier this evening, this whole hill was completely full with, with wildebeest. And now the herds have been scattered as this... Oh, look, quick, 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 she's going to play. Well, it is obviously time to play when uh, you've got a lot of food. And he's going to get involved as well. Oh, look at that. Isn't that just too special? Now, Thomas is wondering, will lions stay in this area when the migration leaves? Thomas, they will. So lions are, are, are very territorial. So even though the migration, when the migration leaves, they will stay here. There is still a lot of animals that stay in the Mara throughout the year. So um, there will be enough food, but obviously not the time of plenty like now. So now those lions are heading back towards that wildebeest that was most recently killed. But I wonder if the hyenas managed to get in there first. Let's keep up with them. Now, the, that young male lion at about 11 o'clock last night actually stole a kill from hyenas. So I wonder if the tides are going to be reversed and the hyenas managed to steal a kill back from the lions. Although I say a kill, it was about two bites of a baby zebra. Paula is wondering why would they repeatedly abandon their kills? Paula, it's because there's just so much around and their instinct takes over. So they're completely focused on every little bit of movement around them. Um, and what I've noticed is they'll often go back and check on a lot of the kills. but uh, <laughs> And then they're like, oh, but I've got another one over there. I better go check on that. I don't want, oh, hyena, 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 hyena. And the lions have seen it. Hyenas are on the kill already, to the, right in front of there. Now, Diane, there we go. This answers your question perfectly. Will other animals eat the abandoned kills? Most definitely, nothing goes to waste out here. Vultures, um, even a jackal, hyena, and some of the smaller predators, even mice and, and rodents will feed on the remnants of these kills. There we go, she's chasing the hyenas. Look at that tail. Now, that is a sign of serious anger. When you see a tail, if you're ever out in the bush and you see a lioness's tail whacking like that and she's looking at you, be careful. Maybe create some distance between yourself and that animal. Let's get a bit closer. Now, for those of you, this is live. We are in Kenya, in the Maasai Mara, during the greatest wildlife spectacle in Africa, the Great Migration. And there is just action happening everywhere this morning. And it, it is for the big cats. It's, it's a great morning. Uh, it's quite overcast, so it's staying darker a little bit longer. There's a, a, quite a stiff breeze, so that's also helping mask them as they try hunt. So it is great Oh, she's after the hyenas again. Okay, wait, let's get closer. Hold on. I just got to be careful. There are quite a lot of boulders and holes here. Oh, boulders. So, the one lioness chased the hyenas right down. She seems to have a real anger towards hyenas. And I've noticed that, that certain lions are, are far, far less tolerant of hyenas than others and maybe she had a bad experience as a cub with hyenas or when she was younger and that's causing her to be more more aggressive she's actually keeping she's going to keep on following them i'm just trying to see if we can see where the hyenas have gone there we go she she's the hyenas are just in front and uh, let's just have a look it looks like she might take one last charge now, of course, I can only see three hyenas at the moment, but if they call for backup, it could get very interesting around these carcasses. Look at them, they're coming in closer. 
Now this is a battle that's been played out for the last 200,000 plus years. Lions versus hyenas on the open savannas of Africa. But everything's calmed down now. Oh, you never know what's going to happen next. Hi, Sally. Uh, Sally wants to know, how much does a lion weigh compared to a hyena? Uh, a really big hyena in the Mara will possibly weigh up to about 65, 70 kilograms, uh, whereas a lioness can weigh as much as 135 kilograms. And I think we have your, yes, a standoff. And it seems like there's action everywhere this morning. It seems like Jamie's lions are heading towards a herd. They missed the first herd. They were spotted very easily by the wildebeest. Now that the dawn has broken, they've lost the advantage of the cover of dark. But that hasn't deterred our young males, and they're still wandering along the course they have set back towards another herd of wildebeest. I'm not sure whether or not they're interested in hunting, although I think that if the wildebeest were to start moving, the lions would absolutely start to chase them. So let's catch up once again. Funnily enough, we're not that far away from Brent now, and we seem to be heading in his direction. Could it be that we have an answer to which pride these young males come from? Oh, don't forget, because all of this is happening live, we can't predict anything that's going to happen. And if you have any questions, you can send them through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Hold on, everyone. We might have a little bit of a bumpy ride, but we can't afford to let the lions get too far ahead of us. Otherwise, they might disappear into the grass again. And you can actually see that walking along the road is probably the best chance this male lion has to remain hidden in the long grass. There we go, Just stopping to have a sniff of something. And we have a question coming through, and thank you and good morning. Oh, is that nice and smelly, mister? Can I have a roll? I'm talking to the lion, of course, not to Bruce, who asked the question. Oh, Bruce, you want to know if it's harder for the lions to hunt outside of the migration? Yes, I think it is. I mean, there's just not the same numbers of animals. I still think they remain well-fed. There's plenty of life here, even when the wildebeest are not around. But last night, these lions had 10,000 or more wildebeest around them. It was easy pickings. And as I said, from a human perspective, very difficult to watch. And I found myself really feeling terribly sorry for some of those wildebeest. I will tell you a happy story, though, something I've never, ever, ever seen in my years in the bush and watching lions hunt. One of them, the little baby wildebeest calf that this male lion caught, actually turned around, turned the tables on the male lion and chased him. And he got such a surprise, he didn't know what to do, so he ran back a little bit, and the wildebeest calf got away. Aww. Oh, this bond between these two boys, as young as they are, is so important, because it's one of the things that will ensure their survival. So while they cuddle up to each other and enjoy a little bit of a rest, now that the dawn is breaking, let's go and find out what's happening in the Mara River. Last week, of course, we had some wonderful action on the Mara River. We saw lions and we actually got a live crossing. Let's go down there now and see what's going on. There we are at the main south crossing, everybody. And uh, while we don't have herds of wildebeest and zebra streaming majestically into the waters, we have got a yellow-billed stork. He's looking for fish, obviously. And what I want you to notice, and we will tell you a bit more about this a bit later, is how much more bubbly the river is. And you see that? It looks a lot fuller. And that's because we have had a lot of rain this week. Now, I wonder, are we, uh, let's, can we swap across to, oh no, let's not swap anywhere. Also sitting at Main South Crossing, where we had a lot of action this week, is a crocodile. Now, these crocodiles, I have to tell you, I think I may have said this before, I do not believe to be blessed of the greatest powers of thinking and intellect in the wilderness. They seem to lurk in the midst of all the animals coming across, and for every animal they catch, they probably miss I'd say 10 or 20, so maybe 1 in 20 attempts is successful. That said, I mean, there's in such plain view so often that it does beg the question as to why the animals keep insisting on crossing into their path. 
Anyway, he's waiting, hopefully, there at one of the crossings. Now, Austin, you want to know how long the Great Migration lasts. And the answer, Austin, is that the Great Migration never ends. The Great Migration continues from the southern plains of Tanzania and Serengeti up into this area and then back down in a continuous circular movement with lots of toing and froing in between. So it really doesn't ever end, Austin. It goes on all the time. Let's have one last look at this rather special, special bird. And they're such good fishermen. But, of course, if you are in the water, you've got to be very careful about keeping your feathers well oiled. Otherwise, they can get drenched and you would have to sink to the bottom. And that would be very unpleasant indeed. We're going to go off to a very short break in a little while. Uh, when you come back, we will tell you all about the rain that we've had, the crossings of the river, and hopefully those lions will go on the hunt once more. And you need to tell us, using hashtag Safari Live, what you want to see after the break. Cheetah or lion? That's hashtag Safari Live, cheetah or lion. We'll see you just now. Hello, Internet viewers. Ah, uh, things seem to be a little bit calmer than, um... Oh, sorry. Apparently, Americans don't know what just now means. I think they'll figure it out, though, Rebecca. Don't worry, because we'll be back shortly. Uh, you saw there Eggsy, everybody. Uh, well done, Eggsy, for making your appearance. He's now gone a little bit red under his oh, impressive beard. <laughs> uh, so far? Very active morning, hasn't it been? I'm just going to have a little um, drink out of my branded water bottle. Mmm. Lovely. And shortly I hope that we're going to have a balloon up in the air. Now what we need to do in the studio, everybody, between every segment, we need to look out of the window and see if the light is bright enough. Fergus, it's not looking great out there, I must say. What do you think? Where they, where they go? You think we can lift the blinds? All right, Ron, we're going to lift the blinds. Eggsy, our stage hand slash editor slash cameraman, is going to help out. I'm going to do my best not to kill myself, my aging bones and limbs. Oh, an enormous, an enormous spider just jumped up. Apparently that one's very weird, says Eggsy, so he'll look after that one. All righty. I've done this one, Eggsy. You see how clever I am. All right, so apparently all the viewers are voting to see cheetah, but there's recalcitrant animals in our crossing parts of the rivers. It makes it very difficult for us to actually show anybody the cheetah. Anyway, hopefully we'll get them. Those five cheetah brothers really are very special indeed. Ah, that's a good idea, Kirsten, yes, because then we can pay it off. You said you wanted to see Cheetah, we'll show you Cheetah, just not quite live yet. All right, the balloon is getting up. Look over here, everybody, I'm just going to show you this picture here. That very small picture that I'm pointing to there means that the balloon feed is coming up. That means Manu is about to take off. That's quite exciting, isn't it? Um, not, that's not Manu. That's somebody holding the basket. <laughs> so, in fact, let's just zoom out from here and I'll just show you what we have to look at. Um, this is called the multi-view. This is a sort of behind-the-scenes look at what's going on here. Uh, this is called the program art. That's where whatever you is live is. That's why I'm there now. Uh, that's the preview. That's what's going to come in next. And then all the other feeds from the cars, the balloon, the river cams, uh, the thermals, the infrareds, all of that sort of stuff we can see over here. Now, I obviously can't control anything from here. That's done from next door. And hopefully we're actually going to go next door, not today, but at some stage to show you the quite amazing talents of the ladies over there. There is, in fact, one man in there now. That, of course, is Mr. Wallington himself. Yes. In fact, I can hear him outside on the radio. We have two minutes left of my waffling. All right, now, uh, let us just... You have, uh, we need to turn this around. Oh, goodness. 
And now this is what happens between every segment, everybody. When the light changes, this mad rush occurs. And we have to change everything around. Egbert goes the other side, I go this side. Fergus tries desperately not to get Egbert into screen in case there's a crash cut. There we are. Okay. 90 seconds, 90. We have to move the... Uh, we have to move all them. <laughs> Fergus's bench out the way. We need our wildebeest skull. There we are. I need my notebook. This is the greyest day since England was invented. House lights up. I'm reading over my what I need to say about the cheetahs. Five brothers, musketeers. One minute, one. Brent is now also without. All right, everybody. Eggsy. Eggsy is a champion. Now, Eggsy, how am I supposed to watch the catch-up clip? Yeah, but then they're going to catch up clip. That's all right, I'll watch there. 30-ish seconds. <laughs> Eggsy <laughs> nearly fell over there, everybody. Don't know why. He seemed to trip <coughs> over a particularly uneven piece of flat ground. Now it's 30 seconds. <laughs> As Ron Atkinson's skit went, Oh, sorry, sir. You seem to have tripped over that deceptively flat piece of ground. All right, 20 seconds. It's calmed down to a mild panic. Welcome back, everybody, to your live migration safari here in the Masai Mara. We've had a wonderful morning so far, and we hope it will continue. Please talk to us, hashtag Safari Live. Many of you have been doing that, and you said during the break that you hoped to see cheetah rather than lion. Not that I think you mind seeing lion, but many of you voted for cheetah. So we're going to show you what happened earlier this week. I'm quickly going to show you something about the difference between these two cats so that we've been watching. Here's a lion, obviously here's a cheetah. Small female, big male. The big thing to notice here is what's called the sagittal crest and the muscle that attaches over there that gives this lion an enormously powerful bite along with a hugely heavy jaw. If you, we go across the cheetah, no sagittal crest, so much smaller uh, space for the muscle to attach and a very delicate bottom jaw. Now here is an enormous bull wildebeest and you can see how difficult it must be for a cheetah one-on-one -on -one, to take out a wildebeest. But if there are five, well, then it seems to be something of a habit. Have a look. The five cheetah brothers of the Musketeer Coalition here stalk the plains like they own them, which of course they do in the absence of the lions and hyenas. Now we're noticing a pattern here. They issue numerous prey options in favour of wildebeest. This calf had no chance in the chase, but the only reason the brothers are able to take on gnus is the fact that they hunt as a team. You can see how on his own, the one brother really struggled with this feisty wildebeest, but once joined by his brothers, the outcome was obvious. But during the feeding, something really interesting happened. Not all was harmony, and the peace with D'Artagnan showing particular exception to his fellow's table manners. Now, this coalition of speedsters is teaching us new things about Cheetah every time we watch them. And a small tribute to jean -Dre, who was on camera there and shot that quite astonishing shot of the cheetahs moving through the sunset. Was that not beautiful? Let's head across down back onto the grey Mara floor with Jamie. Back down to the grey Mara floor where our lion couldn't be closer to said floor if he tried. After a night of full activity our lion is now doing what lions do best which is rolling in something smelly. Oh we're up once again and he is heading off in the direction of his brother and back towards a more wildebeest that are on the horizon. I have to say 
of all, not that I don't like all lions, but of all of them, I have a special soft spot for young males. They've got such an interesting time ahead of them. Now that they've left the safety of their pride, it's come time to spend time with only each other, essentially. And they only have each other for support. And soon, over the coming years, they will gain in strength. And from there, it'll be time to compete with the larger, older males for a territory and for females of their own. Now, I have a question for all of you. I've been asking for your questions. Who do you think has a tougher time of things out here in the Mara? The male lions or the lionesses? And I'm not going to tell you which factors to consider. I think you can think them through yourselves. But it's just an interesting little thing that you can send through on hashtag Safari Live on a Twitter there are the panicked wildebeest in the background. And Laura, you want to know, and I think it's actually a very, very good question because it's something I've thought of often. If lions will get fi fat during the migration, they will certainly have enormous bellies on them at all times. But these animals' metabolism is very, very different to ours and they actually don't store huge amounts of fat. So they don't become obese unless you've got a very artificial situation, like, for example, in captivity. But it's it's very, very, it's basically impossible to see a, an obese lion in the wild. But I do know what you're asking about, and I asked a very similar question when I was working on relocating cheetah, and their muscle structure is totally different. Of course, the dawn has well and truly broken, and there are some things that you can only get a sense of scale of from the sky. There we are in the sky, as Jamie says, and I said earlier, impossible to conceive of the numbers of these herds unless you were watching them from above. That is Manu, who's filming from a balloon over the Maasai Mara. Isn't that beautiful? And that's one of the bends in the river you can see, the forest in the background, and then coming around back to the foreground. And in that area, of course, hugely fertile alluvial soils, which will keep that red oat grass green and nutritious. And that is what the wildebeest are eating. And we're floating gently from the north to the south, northwest to the southeast, and that's a pretty small herd. You saw the earlier images we showed you, but I think that as Manu clears more of the river, we're going to see even larger herds. It's going to be quite spectacular. Now, Debbie, you want to know if the zebra are leading the, or, well, if the zebra leading the migration are more organized. <laughs> Uh, I don't think they're more organized, no, than the wildebeest. I think that they are just as disorganized. I think there are fewer of them, though. And so the chaos that ensues during a hunt is not quite as obvious as it is when the lions get in amongst the wildebeest like we've seen them do. And what's interesting also, Debbie, is that they're designed completely differently. Although both of them migrate, the wildebeest probably cover greater distance. Here they are. Look at that lovely line of them moving there. Isn't that beautiful? The zebra have maintained a design almost exclusively for speed and escape, whereas the wildebeest have modified to a design that allows them to move bigger distances, but they have had to sacrifice speed. And that's one of the reasons that the Cheetah brothers go after these wildebeest. They're excellent food, despite the fact that they are very big. They're slow, and that's why the five of them manage to take these things down all the time. That is a wonderful, wonderful view of the lion snaking up into the plains. Great stuff. Now, Brent's lions, I'm sure, are still going to take their toll on the migration herds. Let's go and find out. Well, unfortunately for them, they moved in the opposite direction to where the biggest herds of the migration are. Oh, look at those wildebeest have spotted that lioness on the turbine from a distance and are storming off on top of the crest. Oh, dear, girls. That wasn't very clever. And especially after you abandoned all your other meat. Now, we've only got two of the lionesses down here, both sitting on top of termite mounds, making themselves quite visible. The young males flop down lazily somewhere in the long grass, but the third lioness, I think, might still be up on top with the kills that were made earlier. So I think I might head back there. Wait. Oh, there's the young male walking through there, but oh, I think they've made the wrong decision. They've just gone in the wrong direction, and... The wildebeest were sitting up top and they've been able to spot the lions from a long distance. And that's how they avoid lions if they are able to see them from a long way away. 
And remember, this is live. We don't know what's going to happen next. And that is what is so amazing. You get to see nature on unfolding in nature's time schedule. Well, it looks like they might head back towards where we've just come from. And there's a lot more wildebeest up on top of that ridge than there are down in this valley. They could have just popped down for a little drink. And we did drive past a little mud wallow. They looked like they were looking for water. But it was just mud. Now, a very interesting question from Heather. Heather is wondering, do lions just kill for fun? Now, we've seen that they've killed multiple animals this morning, and they have not fed on them. Heather, it's not for fun. It, it, is, it is pure instinct. They can't help themselves. And so if there's an animal moving near them, even if they've got the biggest, fattest belly and, and a pile of wildebeest around them, they will attempt to hunt that wildebeest if it comes close enough and it comes within that strike range. Now, a lot of people might consider this sort of mean and nasty, but I don't think there's a mean or nasty bone in a lion. That is, they are pure instinct. They, they live off that instinct, that what helps them to survive. So when there is something to kill close by, they just can't say no. Okay, well, it looks like our lions are moving off in the wrong direction. I'm tempted to go see if there's the one lioness fighting with hyenas on top of the ridge. So I think we're going to do that as the lions cross the lugger. We're going to go to James who's talking about crossing a much bigger lugger, the Morrow River. Yes, indeed, a much bigger river. I just have to comment there on Leo Smith's outfit today. The tablecloth I see has been replaced by a curtain. Wonderful. All right, now, my name is James Hendry, but that's not important. What is important is that Daniela has just got hold of us and said, do elephants ever cross the Mara River? Well, Daniela, the answer is yes, they do sometimes. They swim very well. And we're often asked, do wildebeest or zebra, uh, are they the only ones that cross? And sometimes we see topi crossing, although I must confess that they do more crocodile feeding than they do swimming. But this week, three days ago, we watched the tallest animal of all trying to get across the river. It was at the main crossing. There it is where we have a lot of our action of course and the giraffe are taking an enormous risk here. If they fall over in the water they will never get up again. They cannot lie on their sides and get up especially in a slippery place like this and the rocks are very slippery and you can see how tremendously cautious they are and this incident thankfully ended without any of them falling over. I've watched giraffe and rivers falling over and it is the most traumatic thing to see. What have we got there? We have a crossing underway at Dusty Crossing. Can we go there? Can we go to Dusty Crossing? This is fantastic. It's one lonely, lonely zebra. Go boy, come on now. You've almost made it across. Chilly morning swim. Do your length. No crocodiles around. Come on. Well done. Phew. That was extremely exciting, especially for the zebra. Wasn't that special? I wonder why he's doing that. No one really knows, of course. <laughs> no one has any idea why he decided to, to do that. All right, I think we're going to head across to Jamie, whose lions are still walking about. Our restless souls are still on the move despite their enormously large bellies and of course despite what every single textbook says about the fact that lions like to sleep during the day especially when they fall. These lions have not read the textbooks at all and they are leading us on a mission through the long grasses, through the scattered wildebeest herds and away towards the south. Where are you taking us boys? Where are you wandering off to? Just imagine the magnificence of their story over the coming years, what it's going to be like to see these young males grow up and become potentially as well-known and as magnificent as lions like the Notch Boys and, of course, Scarface, the male lion that we introduced you to last week. I think they might roar. 
I'm just going to listen carefully. I can hear Scarface and the rest of his coalition and the lionesses roaring towards the Mara River. You might even get to see them from the balloon. A quick reintroduction for those of you that have just joined us. My name is Jamie. We were up all night with these lions. I feel like I haven't had a week of sleep, which I haven't, because it was such an adrenaline-filled evening. Definitely one of the most in a way one of the most trying experiences to watch these young males a toy with the young wildebeest and as we watch our lines move towards the ridge prince c thank you for sending through your question of course your questions are the most valuable part of the safari you'd like to know why the lions have different colored manes as a general rule male lions manes will get darker with age so as they get older around about five or so their manes will start to darken and then by about seven then often you'll find males with almost completely black manes these guys are still blonde and scraggly they look like young teenagers that perhaps it could do with a shave now while we catch up with our males let's get going otherwise I'm going to lose them in the grass and Kyle you say that males have a harder time of things I think I agree with you I was trying to work out my own answer to my own question a little bit earlier I agree with you the young males have to leave their pride at around about three years old and they're social creatures especially the young males that don't have any siblings or cousins the same age it must be very traumatizing to be alone and be scared especially since any of the larger male lions could potentially kill them if they were to find them in their territory but during the migration I think it is a time of almost reprieve for especially young males because the older males are fat and distracted they're full they are not patrolling their territories as often and the males can take full advantage of the amount of food available this could get interesting everybody so hold on to your seats they're taking us into well and sick let's go back to Scott and see where his cheats are Well, we've had a serious roller coaster of an adventure while you've been enjoying being on safari with Brent, Jamie and James. There is this coalition of five male cheetah and there's a huge herd of wildebeest just in front of us. I'm not certain why they are not heading towards them. They may well be using the bushes that they were heading behind as some cover to get a little bit closer towards them. My name's Scott. It's great to have you back on board with myself and Jandre. And it may be that they are looking for another point of the river to cross. Interestingly, we crossed the river thinking we would find them on the other side. And when we got to the point where they crossed, we found two lions. And that's obviously what deterred the cheetah from crossing. They ran away. And then we've just crossed back through a little river and I saw these cheetah heading towards the wildebeest and didn't want to take any chances with you guys missing out on any action but it appears like they're a little bit distracted and it appears like they've stopped off at one of the local cheetah cyber cafes to see who's been in town they use big prominent trees not that there's many in this area so this is a good example of one for scent marking and checking in on any females that may be coming into season or any other males that may be snooping around their territory and we'll just get into a spot here where you'll be able to enjoy some beautiful views of these wonderful creatures now judging by their movements it seems like wildebeest are not high on the breakfast menu and they seem more interested in going across to check the northern side of this river where a large portion of their territory is. Emily, you'd like to know what kind of interactions will there be between cheetah and lion and it's a very one-way street. Lion will kill cheetah if they are lucky enough to catch them but of course cheetah are very quickly and also they are very very cautious of lions and that's exactly, I mean, this morning's a great example of that. They were thinking about crossing the river, but they were cautious and obviously detected these, the lion that were there 
in safe enough time for them to move off. Now they're heading straight down into some thick vegetation and I'm guessing that they could well try and cross the river here. Once they have crossed the river, maybe they'll feel like only then breakfast is something they can think about. So that is an exciting prospect. Let's have a quick look up onto the hills there. I think there is some prey in the direction they're heading. Doesn't look like too much, but let's see what happens. You guys are going to take a short break from the safari and be sure to come back to see if these cheetah are on the hunt when you get back. We've just done some pretty gnarly off-roading to get across the riverbed. Um, at one stage I thought we were stuck for good. But we are not. I saw the cheetah from the other side of the river heading straight towards these wildebeest. So I let Kirsty know that she should come to me as soon as possible. And she did, and as soon as she did, the cheetah started heading towards the tree to scent mark and not have anything to do with those wildebeest. But I'm glad we got to give you another view of them. It looks like they are heading straight in towards a camp where there's obviously a point where they may be able to cross. I'm sure they know many of the best crossing points along this river. It's called the Talak River and it's one of the main tributaries that feeds into the Mara River on the Mara Reserve side of the park. So some guests may wake up to some cheetah unless they're already out on safari, which I'm guessing they are. Jandre and I have been racing around like maniacs, trying to work out where the cheetah were. We were shouting across the river to one safari vehicle. The guest must have thought I was crazy to ask where the cheetahs went. But it actually helped greatly because with some hand signals he pointed that they came further upstream. And then we drove upstream and spotted them in the binoculars. This is the guy here, I think. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to stay with these cheats and work out what they do next and send you back to the control room with James. All right, everybody, you're going to see something that I really didn't expect you to have to see, but we have to set up ourselves for a rain catch-up. We had a very rainy week, and I don't think it would be fair for me in the studio to remain dry for this section. Exit, what do you think? So we're going to go to the balloon now. Uh, but apparently you want to watch this. Come, Exy. Let's do this quickly. How long have we got, Kirst? Two minutes. Oh, we've got two minutes. You're going to pour it over my head. Just over your head? Yes. Just not all of it. <laughs> okay. A bit more. Okay, there we go. It's okay. I have a change of clothing. <laughs> okay. Well, that should do it. I feel fresh now. I think it's going to be dry though. It surely won't be dry. You might have to spray me again. Do I look sufficiently drowned? I don't have long enough hair to look drowned. That's, that's perfect for what we want. Okay, good. Balloon. Balloon, good. There we are. We have some, we have some elephants from the balloon. Well done, Egbert. We might have to touch it up a little bit. We've got one minute, one. All right, where are we doing this from? We can do it from here. That's fine. You need to shoot it from here, Ferg. Okay, all right. Just let's have a water bucket handy. <laughs> more. Yeah, a little bit more on my face. <laughs> How much time we got? How much time we got, Kiss? Thirty seconds, thirty. Everybody. Yeah. I reckon X is the second before this. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay. I'll cover it. 
Yeah, back in a bit. Okay, 15 seconds. Sorry, but... Fergus, Bradley, you have to be quiet now. Welcome back, everybody, to your live migration safari from the Masai Mara. Not a keystone of the migration, but a keystone of this magnificent landscape are the elephants, of course. And they, standing in a rather defensive huddle there, the balloons do sometimes make them a little uneasy. And so they've just surrounded the youngsters there and look at the space around them. And I'm sure that they must feel like it's holiday season at the moment with all the wildebeest around here. Look at them there in the background. That is a huge knot of wildebeest, and interestingly how, or interesting how they've formed in that sort of line with a, almost a phalanx, like a, a vanguard moving in some way. I'm not sure why they would have formed like that, but I think the shapes that we see from the air could easily be because of the predators that have been around them during the course of the night. Wasn't that very special? That's great stuff. Now, the rain gods, of course, in the Masai Mara have decreed that there are two rainy seasons, one short and one long. The short one is between October and December. The long one was supposed to end halfway through last month. The rain gods did not get that memo, and so we have been wet thoroughly for the last week. This is wonderful for the grasses, but it makes the rivers very, very treacherous. Have a look here. I always feel a little bit sorry for the animals here because the thunderous storms come in the afternoon and then the animals kind of have to shiver through the windy nights. And they've got nowhere to shelter, of course. And it's great for the grasses, turns them green, provides lots of food. But in the rivers, as I say, it is just very, very treacherous. This started off as a very calm crossing, free of crocodiles, but the bubbles have turned to really dangerous rapids here. And you can see that the crush, the panic, and the exhaustion resulted in some horrific drowning. And I must confess that we've had some very difficult times during this migration season. We've watched those lions killing a lot. We've watched horrible wildebeest deaths in the water, and it's quite harrowing. Brent's lions are up and moving in the dawn. Let's go and find out if they're going to kill again. Well, it's the single lioness who wasn't with the others that have gone down into the lugger, which is of course a little stream for a drink. Now, she's heading towards where the hyenas are. So we're just keeping a close eye. And you can also see on the ridge there, the edge of the mass herds of, of wildebeest that are around here. Now she's lost the rest of her pride. This is not uncommon during the migration where they get split with multiple kills all over the place. Now she is now heading towards the hyenas. The hyenas seem to have noticed her. Now, I can't remember. She could be the really angry hy uh, lioness when it comes to hyenas. There's the hyena walking towards the lions. Or the lion walking towards the hyena. Sorry, I'm so excited. Oh, no. There she goes. Okay, let's keep up with her. Chase that hyena, girlie. Get him. Get him. Remember, this is live from Kenya. Whoops. There we go. There's another rock. Ah, there's the carcass. And there's one of the wildebeest they've killed this morning there. And uh, she's chased off the hyena. There were three hyenas here a little bit earlier. Now... She's just been eating a different wildebeest that they killed earlier. And now she's chased the hyena, but she's completely ignoring the carcass. And she's on the scent trail of the rest of her pride, who have gone down into that little lugger up ahead of us. Well, it's quite a big lugger. Now, Alex is wondering, when the sun comes up, will the lions stop hunting? not at this time of the year and they are opportunists so any time of the year actually if there is a an opportunity to make a kill they will do it they are more successful in the hours of darkness but that's no reason for them not to try during the daylight hours now just over there you can see a slightly darkened area and that's where the water is seeping out of the side of the hill and i think Oh, that's where the rest of the pride headed towards. And she's busy looking for them at the moment. And I think she's going to go head down there. She's had quite a bit of wildebeest. Uh, not enough to make her full. 
but I think she's off for a drink and to meet up with the rest of her pride. So we'll stick with her a bit longer. And while we do that, Jamie is with a male lion. Uh, unlike Brent's lioness, our male lions really could not be more full if they tried. They have full, full bellies of wildebeest. They haven't actually snacked at all during the course of the evening. But just look at the belly on that male lion in a moment because it is utterly gobsmacking just how, just how truly full he is. Look at that. Just have a look at that belly. It extends right up above his shoulders and above his hip bones. And I think, oh, uncomfortable boy. Is it difficult to get a nice, comfortable spot to lie in when you're that full? I don't know if any of you have ever had a particularly large Sunday roast or something similar. But absolutely, in this situation, I think it's particularly uncomfortable for him. Uh, we have another question coming through, and your questions have been truly fantastic today, from Monica. Now, Monica, you would like to know if the male lions will always eat before the females and the cubs. It depends on how full they are, but yes, most of the time, the male lions will absolutely tuck in first. And they often steal the entire carcass away from the lionesses. A couple of weeks ago, I was following the Notch Boys and the lionesses of the area around lookout hill and the lionesses despite the fact that they hunted and killed a fully grown zebra basically never got any of it the males scoffed at all and the lioness had to keep hunting even well into the morning though so really male lions do get the lion's share of the meal and in fact i think that's probably where the saying comes from now off towards us in the distance is the Mara River, and that is home to the male lions of the Musketeer Coalition. Not to be confused with the Cheetah Coalition that Scott is with, but the Musketeer male lions, which includes, of course, the Scarface male lion. And I think we're going to dash down there and see if we can find him, because he sounds like he's roaring close to us. Hopefully I am correct in that, but speaking of being right and wrong, let's go back up to the migration control so that James can question you on both of those things. Look at this. We've got vultures and marabou stork in that tree. Now they are also hugely important because they are the cleanup crew of the migration. All of them scavengers. Some of them will sometimes kill for themselves if there's no food. The white-backed vultures and the griffin vultures and some of those storks. But there is such bountiful stuff all over the ground here. And last week I made mention of the fact that huge numbers of animals die of natural causes out here. I'm beginning to think that although that is true, clearly we've seen lions killing and then leaving food without eating it. And so perhaps many of the carcasses that we find and we may have mistaken for natural caused deaths are in fact lions that have decided that they're too full. Now, as Jamie mentioned, it's time to play our game, everybody. The fifth installment of Two Truths and one lie. I've lost all the games so far. I'm hoping this week will be slightly different. This week we're talking about Wildebeest once again. How you play this game is you tweet hashtag Safari Live answer one, answer two or answer three depending on which one of the following three statements you think is nonsense. So I'll give you three statements. One is nonsense and then you hashtag Safari Live answer one, answer two or answer three depending on which one you think is rubbish. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready here. Here we go. Statement or answer number one is that the wildebeest that we get in the migration is known as the white bearded gnu. Good. Statement number two is that the white bearded gnu is the only species of wildebeest in Africa. Statement number three is that some 250,000 wildebeest die during the migration season or the migration year. So. Answer number one, the wildebeest we're seeing is the white-bearded gnu. Number two is that they are the only wildebeest species in Africa. And number three is that some 250,000 migrating wildebeest die during the course of the year. Let's go to some much more living versions with Scott. Welcome back. And as James says, we have a multitude of wildebeest ahead of us and 
We're just taking a slow peruse. The cheetah did end up crossing that riverbed and decided to curl up into a huddle and go to sleep. So we've decided to head off and see what else we can find, possibly other cheetah. One morning we saw 12 cheetah in four different sightings in this area, so there certainly are more cheetah around. There are also good numbers of lions in this area. So good prospects and the joy of being on safari is you simply do not know what you are going to bump into and when. Hello to Ali and Sophia. You would like to know how much do the wildebeest need to eat to survive? And I would say between 5 and 10 kilograms of grass a day would be the average daily requirements for these wildebeest. And <clears throat> I guess because there are so many of them, that's what causes them to migrate. If they didn't move as far and wide as they did in search of all this food that there's plentiful amounts of at this time of the year. You can see they've done a good job of already mowing this area flat though and possibly these herds will then move east towards where James and Brent, uh, Jamie and Brent are where there's clearly a lot more grass. You would have noticed that where they are. And as you can see, these will be actually facing in that direction. So I'm guessing they would have come into this area, realized the front-running wildebeest had already come in and mowed it. So these guys are kind of a little bit late, I guess. They're at the back of the queue. Okay, we're going to keep on searching for anything exciting and send you back to Jamie in the meantime. Well, it's, it's Brent <laughs> Yeah. And uh, there's our lonely lioness, the last one, who's obviously a little bit more hungry than the others, heading off towards where the rest of the pride are. And as we suspected, they're headed for a drink in that seep. Now, if you look very carefully where my finger point is there, that is a lazy lion. So I think their morning activities are over and the whole pride will be re reunited and they have given us an absolute roller coaster. Now, as our lions disappear, James Hendry in Migration Control has been very mean about all my different shukas that I wear. So I've got this one. It's a different one from last week. Last week was a red one. And I've known James for over 10 years and I've been wondering why is he so mean? I think they're very nice and they're quite warm when you're out here. And I realized he's jealous. He doesn't have one. So Jamesy, yesterday I went and made sure you got your own shuka. And see, it is new, so they, I haven't put any itchy powder or hairy caterpillars or anything on the shuka. And you might wonder why there are two. It's because next week, Jamesy, we're going to be twinsies. You're going to have to wear one, and I'll wear my one. <laughs> and, of course, James is going to fight this. So I'm going to need your help to get James to wear his shuka next week. So I think... What the hashtag should be shooker up with the hashtag Safari Live. So let's go see how Jamesy feels about being twinsies. <laughs> I, <think it's>, I, <laughs> I have nothing to say to that. That's very good. Um, <laughs> what can I say? All right, yes, <laughs> to the answers to two truths and one lie. Uh, I'm afraid I lost again, unsurprisingly. Now, I must just warn you, next time we play this game, we have two more times to play it, you will not be using any kind of search engine. You have to promise me that you'll do that, okay? Good. 5% of you said that the white-bearded GNU is not the GNU that we see here. It is. It is called a white-bearded GNU, and you can see the white beard that they have. Then 85% of you, some of you are no doubt using the internet for an aid, said that that is not, in fact, the only wildebeest in Africa. And you were, of course, right. It's not the only wildebeest. There are two species, a number of different subspecies of the white-bearded GNU, but the other wildebeest species is called a black wildebeest, a magnificent creature that occurs in southern Africa.
And then 10% of you said that 250,000 uh, was perhaps too much or too few of wildebeest to die during the migration. But in fact, it is correct. 250,000 wildebeest die on the migration route each year. Let's head down to Jamie, who is not wearing a tablecloth, a curtain or a shuka. She's starting to feel a bit left out of this whole process. I think perhaps I need to claim a shook of my own and we can all gather together and look like the world's strangest collection of tablecloths or curtains. Now I think I know exactly where these lions are. I'm heading towards the Mara River. Our male lions were fast asleep and so I thought let's go to where the Paradise Pride and the male lions of the Musketeer Coalition spend their days essentially capitalizing on the fear and panic of the wildebeest and the zebra that have to cross the Mara River. And they basically just hang out in the thickets around it and pounce when the moment presents itself. And as it starts to get warmer this morning, there's a good chance that the wildebeest and the zebra will start to move through this area. Now let's go and see whether or not we have any luck. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. We've got to see Scarface right at the last minute in last week's live safari. I'm hoping perhaps that we can repeat that. This is an area that I've become particularly familiar with. I'm going to stop for a second and show you something because I can only imagine how extraordinary it must look. Just have a look off in the distance. I can see the ground is black with wildebeest. Let's go right up into the hot air balloon to go and see what it looks like. We were going to go up into the balloon, everybody. I think we've lost the picture. Can we go there? No, we can't. I'm afraid we've lost picture. We just got wonderful views there of enormous herds of wildebeest on the plains. We're going to try it there. No, it's gone again. Sorry about that, everybody. There seems to be a signal problem there. We can, however, I think if we'd like to go down to the river, because as it's a dusty crossing, we've got a fairly large number of hippopotami there. This is my favorite crossing, everyone, especially in the evening. Not necessarily because of the crossings, but because it's the most peaceful one. And I want you to imagine sitting on the edge of this river, listening to the gentle grunt of the hippo when the water is flat like a mill pond like it is here with a cup of coffee or perhaps in the evening with your favorite tipple. And just imagine absorbing the atmosphere. It's soft, the lovely smells of the dust and the grass all around you, the smell of the wind, which and the feeling of that warm wind that blows early on in the evenings. And I've got to tell you, if you've ever spent that sort of time in Africa, you'll want to do it again and again and again. Now, Andrew, and you're wondering why they cross at these spots with very bad rapids. Let's head across to Maine North, and I'll explain that there. The thing about rapids, Andrine, is that they mean that the water is shallow. So it means that the animals can walk on the bottom and I guess because they're not blessed of enormous intellectual powers, the fact that they can stand on the bottom and the fact that they know that they can stand on the bottom at these various traditional crossing points means that they're going to try regardless. And I don't think that they realize the level of danger that the water, pose, uh, or water poses. So they cross here very often. And often there are rocks exposed here and they walk across. And that's because, of course, they are, as I've said before, they're then able to kick away from the crocodiles when they get Get attacked. But of course if the river rises too much and you're not blessed of the greatest, uh, what should we say, um, hydrological knowledge, well then you're going to get yourself into trouble and that's exactly what happens to them. Now we're going to head across to Brent Leo Smith who's managed to find the remainder of the vanguard of the Great Migration. Here we go, we're right on the, well, on the edge of the herd that those lions were hunting the whole of last night. And there we go, you can see a lovely mixture of zebra and wildebeest, with wildebeest being the most predominant. And one of the most amazing things for me since I've been spending so much time around these wildebeest and around the migration is that an area like this, you see this incredibly long red oat grass in when we come back here next week, it'll be short as anything. Now, of course, the wildebeest seem to be quite hapless in the face of all the predators attacking them. But 
sorry about that, everybody. Now, we do have a little bit of difficulty sometimes bringing you high-definition pictures from the world's most magnificent landscape, and that's what happened there. So you've come back to me in the migration control. I'm just going to show you that we have a wonderful view. We can perhaps do it from the mountain cam. There it is. Wonderful. Well done, everybody. I uh, can't see a huge amount down there at the moment. I'll keep searching. We're going to go away for a short break. When you come back, all the predators and all the herds together. See you very shortly. All right, we're now in ad break with the internet. Hello, internet, all of you. Uh, there's the mountain cam. I'm just listening to Kirsten at the moment, everybody. Right, right, yes, good, okay, fine. Um, Okay. Good. Got it. I think we might have to move our grass, chaps. Just a little bit. Um, well, except if we move it a little bit. No, no, Is that fine? That's fine. Okay. That's no, fine. The cameraman says it's fine. A sweep through the grass. Okay. People will be so amazed. Eggsy's feet are going to be sore from kicking the grass. That's the mountain cam you're looking at, everyone. It's quite nice, isn't it? That's my view. That's Stefan Zoo. Stefan and I sit here many hours of every day doing bits and pieces. It's good fun. I'll see if you can find, or see if I can find you something. I'll tell you what would be nice, Kirsten, is if I find the Angama Pride from here. Wouldn't that be nice? Connective tissue? Yes, it would. But will I find them? Lots of wildebeest, you can be sure that in amongst that lot somewhere, the Angama Pride is lurking. And we can do face off, still, if you want, we've got some crocs. Okay. Okay, no Angama Pride there just yet. And lots of wildebeer streaming up. They are going to get themselves into trouble. Now, I think the easiest way to find the Angama Pride, of course, from here, is to find cars. I know that's not the most romantic way to find animals. It's not exactly like tracking lions, but it uh, must be done from time to time. And we have two minutes and 43 seconds until we go back to TV. All righty, Jamie's lion's calling. Let's go across there. calling anymore, I'm afraid. She's decided to go silent, just as James sent you all the way across to us. <laughs> She's gone quiet once again, but I think there's a good chance they're going to vocalize shortly. They've been calling all morning. No, don't. Come back. You've got a full wildebeest that way. Don't go that way, please. I can't follow you that way. Come back here. Now, this is right on the side of the Mara River, so it's either the Magoro lionesses. I think it's the three Magoro lionesses. And there's a little bit of confusion between them and the Paradise Pride that lurks around here as well. Oh, dear girl. That's very inconvenient. Sit down, please, for two minutes. Please. No sign of the males around here yet, but that doesn't mean they're not here. It took me a while to spot them before. I'm just going to settle here for a second because there is a lioness behind us. Liam, can you see how close she is? Five meters. Try to work out if I can turn around. Let's go forward a bit. There we go, good girl.
There we go. Thank you, girl. Oh, wait, listen. They might start to call again. This would be truly marvellous if they could roar in 60 seconds. What a fantastic way it would be to go back into re our television audiences rejoining us. Whew. I'm going to sleep well today. There's a hyena in the background as well, but far away. Welcome back to your live safari from the heart of the Maasai Mara here in Kenya where we are sitting very close to the banks of the Great Mara River and we have been following the call of lions all morning. First we were with those young males and I said I thought I heard others calling. It's these females. So we didn't catch up with the famous Scarface but we have caught up with the lionesses. And they are starting to call. Let's see if this lioness is going to join in shortly. There we go. We're up. And she's going to walk past us. And remember, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Come on, girls. Give us a roar. You've been calling all morning. I know you can do it. Oh, the three lionesses that spend a great deal of time around the Mara River. And, of course, these are the same lionesses. Oh, look, she's the same one that's missing the tip of her tail. These are the same lionesses that we saw with Scarface last week at the end. Oh, now she's caught. Oh, off she goes. How cool is that? Holly, you'd like to know where that lioness's tail tuft go went. Chances are, Holly, whoopsie, chances are it actually disappeared thanks to the bite of a hyena. Look, it could have been a nip from another lion and perhaps it got a bit infected and made her, essentially made the tip of her tail drop off. But there's quite a few tail tipless lionesses in this area and my guess would be an attack by hyenas our lion lionesses are wandering off they don't seem to be even vaguely interested in the carcass they've left behind the vultures will be however and it sounds like scott has found some more hello everyone and this vulture seems to inv be investigating an old crime scene and I'm guessing what has happened is a kill was made here and hyena have come in and demolished most of what was left by the lion, cheetah or leopard or whoever made the kill and it's just kind of snooping about for any little titbits it had a little piece of bone earlier and thankfully for it at the moment so there's just so much food around that it's probably not too worried and it looks like it may possibly think about going elsewhere to look for a meal what I love about vultures, and we seldom get to get close looks at them, is their little scarf. Much like I am wearing, not a shuka, this is called a kikoi, it's another Kenyan garment. It can be used as a man's skirt as well, or a lady's sarong. Now if we take another look at the, at the vulture, you'll see that it also has its own specially developed kikoi around its neck. You can see those feathers blowing around its neck there, and it's essentially a scarf to keep its unfeathered neck nice and warm. When they're feeding, obviously, they extend their neck out of the scarf, and you'll notice there's no feathers, so they're relatively dirty jobs of cleaning up the carcasses of the African wilderness. It at least allows them to keep their head and neck relatively clean as it is unfeathered. Is it going to take off, or is it looking for more little scraps, like an investigator at a crime scene? Oh, 
hard to say. What else? What also could happen is other vultures could see this one here and get confused. I mean, there's not much going on, but other vultures with their incredible eyesight from three kilometers or three miles rather up in the sky, they could notice this vulture and swoop down to investigate what on earth it is doing down here. So they really do have quite incredible eyesights. And once the chain reaction starts flooding into all the eyes, the, the, the eyes of the vultures in the sky, you can get huge, huge flocks of vultures descending down onto kills. And it's something that I'm sure we will be able to show you before the end of this migration safari series. Okay. We're going to send you back into the control room with James to let you, who's going to let you know a little bit, a bit more about the lions. Indeed, a little bit about our lions. Some of the lions that you've met but we haven't seen for a little while. The Angama pride there, four lionesses, of course, 13 cubs. You named the one lioness Sarabi. There she is. And they have, since the arrival of the migration, had a really wonderful time. But, of course, before the migration arrived, things were a little more difficult. Have a look. From the tree-lined gullies to the fertile hillside of the Ulu Lolo Escarpment lives the Angama Pride. The four lionesses are the mothers and aunts to 13 cubs. The oldest was born in February and the youngest in the middle of June. 13 lion cub appetites are hard to satisfy. Even harder before the migration herds move through the grasslands. There is still food available, especially near water holes. Tall grass gives cover to the perfectly camouflaged cat. The breeze masks her scent and the sound from her paws. Her meal is wily and wary. This hungry mother will have to try again. While the lionesses are out hunting, the cubs are under constant threat. Danger lurks when they come out to play in front of their enemies. Persistence pays off. Despite the meager pickings, the lionesses manage to feed the cubs. Soon, the migration herds will arrive, and the Angama pride will feast off an abundance of food for months. Welcome back live on the vehicle. And now, James has just been explaining about the Angama lions and the migration. Now, a lot of those things James has been telling you fall in with all the different lion prides but the Angamas this year are especially having a bumper year we've been speaking to the local guides our rangers who accompany us at oh no, no, sorry i have been up all night accompany, accompany us out at night and they say they've never seen such groupings of wildebeest in that northern section of the triangle where the Angamas are so really really interesting now we know the Paradise Pride have got their sort of set up. They just wait around the crossings. The Mogoros wait at the drinking spots. Now the Ngamas are just completely surrounded by wildebeest at the moment. Now, what I've found quite interesting with all the different lion prides, and I've been spending quite a bit of time with the Salt Lake Pride and the Egyptian Goose Pride and uh, Ngirara Pride, and the wildebeest seem to move in and out. They don't spend as long in those areas. And I was just watching now as I was driving. Unfortunately, they all ducked over the ridges as we got here. But some wildebeest were going south and others were going north. So why were some going that way and others going that way? There's been rain all around.